talk of today uh, by Cesar Rosales from the Universidad of Granada. Uh, he's going to talk to us on isoperimetric inequalities in weighted manifolds via the second variation formula. Okay, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yeah? Well, uh, I would like to thank first uh, Jose Maria for the kind invitation and also Asun Jimenez for supporting my stay. Uh, this is my first time in Brazil and it is a pleasure to me to be here and to participate in this edition of the colloquio. Uh, okay, uh, in, my, in my talk today I will explain some of the results obtained in this uh, work in progress uh, where I studied stable and isoperimetric regions in weighted uh, Riemannian manifolds, Riemannian cylinders more precisely satisfying certain uh, curvature conditions. The techniques in, in this work are mostly inspired uh, by this uh, previous paper where we analyzed uh, similar questions for love concave perturbations of the Gaussian density in Euclidean space. Okay, uh, in order to describe my contribution uh, properly, uh, let me start by introducing uh, the notation and recalling uh, some motivating results. Well, uh, by a weighted, uh, a weighted manifold is a, a smooth uh, metric measure space that is a, a smooth connected Riemannian manifold where we introduce a smooth and positive function uh, which is used to weight uh, the Riemannian volume. These objects are uh, natural generalizations of Riemannian manifolds with uh, applications in several branches of mathematics like uh, functional analysis, uh, probability theory and optimal transport. Uh, in this setting, uh, one of the right uh, notions of curvature is the so-called uh, Bakriameri Ricci tensor that involves uh, the Riemannian Ricci tensor of the ambient manifold and the Hessian, the Riemannian Hessian of the logarithm of the density. This tensor uh, is useful uh, to provide generalizations to weighted manifolds of some well-known results, uh, comparison results in, in classical Riemannian geometry, like for example Meyer's theorem or Bishop's theorem, and it also allows uh, generalizations of some classical isoperimetric inequalities like uh, the Levy-Gromov uh, inequality. Uh, moreover, uh, thanks to this uh, tensor, important objects like uh, radiant reaching solitons can be characterized in this way. So uh, such, a tolid, such a soliton is nothing but a weighted manifold uh, where uh, the Bakriameri Ricci tensor is proportional to the Riemannian metric. This is a, a generalization of, of uh, Einstein manifolds and as we know, these objects play an important role in understanding the singularities of the Ricci flow. Uh, well, now let me introduce uh, notions of weighted uh, volume in area. Uh, the volume of a, of a borel set and the area of a smooth hypersurface are computed just by integrating uh, the, the weight that we usually also call density with respect to the Riemannian uh, elements of volume in area respectively. Of course, uh, if the density, if the weight is the constant one function, then we just recover the, the classical notions of volume in area. Uh, on the other hand, one can define, uh, one can define the perimeter of any borel set uh, in several ways, for example, by using the Minkowski content or by following the distributional approach of the Georgi. And anyway, uh, the important thing is that This is the manifold. Uh, when, when I denote M, I know I'm not taking into account the boundary. The whole manifold with the boundary will be denoted by M bar. So when you have a set E with uh, a smooth boundary inside, uh, inside M, then the, the perimeter agrees with uh, the weighted area of such a smooth boundary. This means that uh, for this perimeter, the, the portion of the boundary of the set, which is inside the boundary of the ambient manifold, uh, does not contribute. Only the interior boundary is taken into account. 
Okay, so once we have notions of, of volume and perimeter, we can try to study the partitioning problem where, where we minimize the perimeter functional uh, among sets enclosing inside the, the manifold a given amount of volume. The solutions to this problem, when exist, uh, are usually called isoperimetric regions and they are global minimizers of, of perimeter under a volume constraint. In this talk, we will be also interested in stable regions, which are second uh, order minima of the perimeter functional associated to volume preserving variations of the set, uh, keeping the boundary, preserving the boundary of the, of the ambient manifold. Of course, any isoperimetric region is a stable one, but the converse is not true in general. Uh, well, uh, the, the complete characterization of, uh, of these sets is uh, for, for arbitrary weighted manifolds is a very difficult task. So uh, it is natural to study first uh, densities, those densities in simple spaces like Euclidean space or space forms, uh, having a special form or a nice behavior with respect to a certain subgroup of uh, isometries or diffeomorphisms of the ambient space. Uh, for example, in, in recent years, several authors have paid much attention to, to this problem for uh, radial and homogeneous uh, weights in Euclidean space with many important contributions. This is a non-exhaustive list. Uh, but our motivation today does not come from, from this kind of densities, but from uh, mm, other results concerning stability and isoperimetry for uh, perturbation of, of the Euclidean Gaussian density. So uh, let me spend some time in, in recalling some of the results. Well, we start with uh, the Gaussian setting. Uh, the Gaussian isoperimetric uh, inequality states that in, in Euclidean space with, uh, with Gaussian density, uh, half spaces are always isoperimetric regions. Observe that uh, this is very different to the classical isoperimetric inequality in Euclidean space where round balls are the unique minimizers. <coughs> the intuition behind this result uh, is more or less that because of the rapidly decreasing density, the minimizers are going to be concentrated at infinity. Uh, more rigorously, this inequality uh, can be deduced from approximation argument, combining the fact combining the solution to the isoperimetric problem in round spheres with the fact that the Gaussian density is uh, the limit of orthogonal projections onto, air, on, onto the Euclidean space of uh, uh, uniform probability densities on high dimensional spheres with suitable radii. So by, by employing uh, approximation arguments and the solution to the isoperimetric problem in spheres, you can deduce uh, this, uh, this theorem. Unfortunately, this approximation scheme does not provide the uniqueness of minimizers. This was achieved several years, many years uh, later by Carlen and Kers, who finally showed that uh, any isoperimetric region must be equivalent to, uh, to a half space. And very recently, uh, McGonagall and Ross, two students of Minicocci, uh, used uh, the second variation formula together with suitable uh, uh, volume preserving deformations to characterize how spaces are the unique, smooth, and stable regions of finite perimeter. Unfortunately, uh, they did not deal with, uh, with uh, regions having singularity at the boundary. So uh, the solution to the isoperimetric problem cannot be deduced directly from their result. Okay, uh, some of the techniques uh, which were employed to, to solve the, the Gaussian isoperimetric problem were used to, to prove a Levy-Gromov type inequality with uh, isoperimetric model, uh, the Gauss space. In the particular case of a Euclidean convex domain, with this uh, love concave, with a love concave perturbation of the, of the Gaussian density, this comparison says that uh, the perimeter of any, the weighted perimeter of any Borel set is greater than or equal to the Gaussian, the Gaussian perimeter of a uh, Euclidean half space enclosing the same volume. The Gaussian volume of the half space is the same as the weighted volume of our set. This is valid when we also assume that this is a probability density, which means that the, the global volume is equal to one. 
Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this comparison is not optimal in general. So uh, it is interesting to investigate which are the isoperimetric regions for this kind of perturbations of the Gaussian density. We have a lower bound. In general, it's not optimal. So the question is, which are the, the minimizers uh, in this setting? Well, uh, first uh, result uh, in this line is due to Brock, Chacho, and Mercaldo. Uh, they, uh, they solve the partitioning problem inside a coordinate half space together with this uh, law uh, love concave perturbation of the of the Gaussian density. Uh, they combine uh, they combine a, an optimal transport argument together with the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality in the whole uh, space uh, to prove uh, that uh, have spaces orthogonal to the to the ambient have space uh, are the unique minimizers. Uh, for the case n equal to zero. Uh, note that uh, this is nothing but the Gaussian density, and so uh, as a particular case, they recover the solution to the partitioning problem inside a, a Gaussian coordinate half space. But in fact, uh, this result, this is a direct consequence of the Gaussian isoperimetric inequality in the whole Gauss space and a reflection argument across the boundary. Uh, now, uh, observe that uh, the, the weight of Brock, Chacho, and Mercaldo is a product, is a product density where the horizontal factor is purely Gaussian and uh, the vertical factor is a, a particular love concave perturbation of uh, the Gaussian density, the one dimensional Gaussian density. Well, uh, in, in, a, in the recent work I, I mentioned before, uh, we consider uh, arbitrary have spaces or slabs and uh, similar densities, similar product densities with the difference that now in the vertical factor we have an arbitrary love concave perturbation. In this setting uh, we were able to characterize uh, stable regions of, uh, of finite perimeter and we deduced that uh, we have only two, two of these uh, stable regions, which are uh, vertical half spaces uh, or horizontal ones. Now, uh, since we allowed our stable regions to have singularities, then uh, we, can, uh, we can compare them isoperimetrically in order to obtain which, uh, which one is, is the better one. So uh, after this isoperimetric comparison, uh, we deduce that the winners are vertical half spaces, which are uh, those uh, meeting the boundary orthogonally. And very, very recently, uh, Brock, Chacho, and Mercaldo, by using the same te techniques as in the, as in the previous work, uh, proved that in, this, uh, in, this in the cylinder over this Euclidean uh, box, with this uh, product density, where now the, the vertical factor is, uh, is Gaussian and the horizontal factor is a certain uh, strictly love concave perturbation of the Gaussian density, uh, horizontal half spaces uh, are the unique isoperimetric regions. Okay. So uh, these, uh, these are the results, I, the motivating results I wanted to mention. And now a straightforward analysis shows that uh, all these results have some things in common. Uh, first, uh, the ambient, the ambient domain is a, a convex uh, a, a cylinder in Euclidean space bounded by hyperplanes. And the densities considered are product densities where the, the vertical factor is Gaussian and the, the horizontal factor is a particular uh, love concave perturbation of the n-dimensional uh, Gaussian measure. Uh, note, observe now that the concavity hypothesis, the concavity perturbation of the horizontal factor implies that the associated by Kriemery Ricci uh, curvature for our weighted manifold has this positive lower bound which corresponds to the value of the back Kriemery Ricci curvature for the Gauss space. And moreover, uh, due to the Gaussian vertical factor here, uh, this lower bound becomes an equality when we consider the, uh, the vertical killing field to the cylinder. 
uh, um, observe also that uh, in the statement, all the, all the theorems says that the isoperimetric regions are bounded by uh, families of parallel hyperplanes uh, meeting orthogonally the boundary. Okay, so now uh, our motivation, our main aim is, uh, is to, to use a unified approach uh, based on the, on the second variation formula for area and volume in weighted manifolds in order to describe not only isoperimetric but also uh, stable regions in a more general setting. Okay, so let me describe now uh, which is going to be this, uh, this setting. We will be considering a, a Riemannian cylinder over a, an arbitrary Riemannian manifold, uh, maybe with boundary, in which case uh, we suppose that the boundary is uh, locally convex. Uh, inside this uh, product, in this, inside this Riemannian cylinder, we will take a, a, a product density. This will be the horizontal factor. This is the vertical one, which will be a smooth and positive, including the boundary. And uh, we assume that our, our product densities have a, a positive uh, lower bound on the back Riemannian Ricci curvature, which is in fact, uh, the, which is achieved for the, for the vertical for the vertical killing field. Well, uh, is there some rigidity uh, behind this hypothesis? Well, it is, uh, it is uh, easy to see that uh, the conditions on the Bakri and Ricci curvature implies two things. The first one is that if we consider the weighted manifold that we have in the base of the cylinder, which is uh, omega together with the horizontal factor of the density, then this weighted manifold satisfies the same positive uh, curvature bound. And uh, more strictly, we have the following. Uh, if you analyze uh, this equality, then rapidly you deduce that the vertical factor of the density is completely determined and is a, a Gaussian type density. A Gaussian type density. So these two things are equivalent to these uh, two ones. Uh, for these densities, uh, there, is also some, there are also two interesting properties that hold. The first one is that the, because of this, because of this uh, lower bound, positive lower bound on the Ricci curvature, we have some kind of uh, Myers theorem. This theorem of, mm, does not say that the manifold is compact. That's not true. Think of the Gaussian space, for example. But we can, what we can deduce in this case is that uh, the, the finite volume is finite, the, the global volume is finite. And this will be important later in order to deduce existence of isoperimetric regions. And moreover, if we define have spaces, have spaces or horizontal have spaces, better horizontal have spaces, as uh, in, in this way, then uh, the perimeter of these have spaces is, is finite. So uh, somehow uh, we can, as in previous result, we can, we can imagine that these have spaces are nice uh, candidates to solve the isoperimetric problem in this setting. Indeed, uh, this is true, this intuition is true, and, and this is uh, what we prove in the, in, the first pan, in the first part of our isoperimetric theorem. These have spaces are always minimizers. And uh, the second part of the theorem is, a, is, about, uh, is about uniqueness, and it, uh, it gives some uh, rigidity properties that any minimizer must satisfy. More precisely, if we denote, if we have an isoperimetric region and we denote by sigma the interior part, uh, the interior part of the boundary, which will be this, this here, then uh, this hypersurface must be uh, smooth, connected, uh, total geodesic inside the, the Riemannian cylinder and also it must meet uh, the boundary of the cylinder orthogonally. Moreover, it also holds that the, the normal derivative of the logarithm of the density must be constant. The normal Bakri-Emery Ricci curvature achieves the positive lower bound on the normal, the, uh, achieves the positive lower bound and uh, the second fundamental form of the boundary of the ambient cylinder vanishes along the normal direction. Uh, and finally, we, we also deduce 
that uh, there is a, a neighborhood of, uh, inside the cylinder containing the, the hypersurface, which splits isometrically as uh, the hypersurface sigma cross an open interval. Okay, so uh, this is the result, and, and now let me emphasize uh, some, some particular situations mm, where the result holds. First, uh, the result applies for arbitrary convex cylinders in, in Gauss space, uh, thus uh, generalizing many previous results for uh, have spaces or slabs. You can take an arbitrary convex, solid convex cylinder, and the result holds. Okay. Uh, the result uh, also, the theorem also applies uh, when you have a Riemannian cylinder together with a, a product density in such a way that the Bakri Emery uh, Ricci curvature is positive and constant. This is, for example, the, the case of uh, shrinking radiant Ricci in solitons of product, uh, of product type. And this includes, as a, as a very particular case, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, gradient rich, so this shrinking gradient rich soliton, which is given by the, the cylinder over an Einstein manifold of positive uh, rich curvature, uh, together with the, uh, a, a constant horizontal factor. And, uh, and finally, the theorem also applies in the, in the following situation. In this situation, you have uh, your cylinder, and now in the base, you do the following. You have in the base uh, a weighted manifold, which at first is uh, any radian, uh, any shrinking radian, rich soliton, and now you, uh, you produce a perturbation. You produce a love concave perturbation of the potential, of the potential function associated to the soliton. Observe that uh, this, uh, this case is new even for the n-dimensional uh, Ricci soliton be because, uh, because of the, re the reason is that previous results employed only some particular uh, kind of love concave perturbations, and this is general. Okay, uh, in general, uh, these uh, horizontal have spaces are not going to be the unique minimizers. There are many, there are many examples. Uh, however, having a look at the rigidity properties that we deduce in this result, we can provide some, uh, some sufficient conditions ensuring uniqueness. Uh, for example, we will have uniqueness when the positive uh, lower bound on the Ricci curvature is only achieved up, up to a constant for the vertical killing field. Uh, this enforces, this condition enforces the, the, normal, the normal direction uh, to, be, to be vertical so that it is easy to deduce from this fact that uh, sigma must be a horizontal hyperplane, a horizontal slice, and so the, the minimizer must be a horizontal half space. Uh, this this happens, for example, this condition holds, for example, when we have in the base a uh, shrinking radian rich soliton and we produce a, lot, uh, a strictly love concave perturbation of the potential function of the soliton. Well, another case when we will obtain uniqueness is uh, where the boundary of the ambient cylinder is uh, locally strictly convex. Uh, the reason is that in this case, this rigidity property uh, um, together with uh, the fact that the angle function between the vertical killing vector and the normal direction to the hypersurface must be constant because the hypersurface is totally geodesic, allows us to deduce again that the, the unique minimizers are horizontal half spaces. Uh, and finally, this condition about the gradient can, can be used to produce uh, uniqueness in, in some cases. For example, in Sn cross R, when we end up with this horizontal weight. Uh, well, I still have to check the details, but, but probably the proof, uh, the proof of this fact, that the proof that we have uniqueness in this case probably can be extended uh, to the case in which Sn is replaced by an, an Einstein manifold of positive Ricci curvature. Okay, so these are some cases when we have uniqueness, uh, maybe there are more, uh, I still uh, study this. 
Um, okay, now let me, let me give you a, a brief outline of the proof which follows a very, very classical scheme. Well, in the first, the, first uh, the first step of the proof is when we obtain existence of minimizers with nice boundaries. We use some known results in geometric measure theory to produce existence of isoperimetric regions. Uh, here, by nice boundary, I mean, of course, with uh, enough regularity to make computations. Uh, now, remember that any isoperimetric region is also stable. So, uh, by classifying uh, stable regions, we are finding the most natural candidates uh, to be minimizers. Uh, this is done in the, in the second step, and once we have the candidates, we only have to, to compare their perimeter for fixed volume in, in order to say which one is better. And this is what uh, we do in this, uh, in this third step by means of uh, integration of, of second-order differential inequalities. Okay, so uh, this, is the, this is the idea of the proof. And in the, in, my, in the last part of the talk, I will give you some, some more details of uh, the three steps. Okay, first let's, uh, let us speak a bit about uh, existence and regularity of minimizers in, in general weighting manifolds, if you want, because, because most of the, uh, all the results here are valid for, for arbitrary weighted manifolds. Well, as happened in Riemannian manifolds, the existence of minimizers is, is not ensured. There are situations when they not exist. In fact, this is a, a difficult problem where only some partial results exist, showing that the existence of minimizers depend on uh, the behavior of the density at infinity. However, recall that in our situation, the, the global volume is finite. And in this case, uh, the existence is guaranteed. Let me say some two words about it. Uh, fix, a, fix a volume. And, and now, uh, take a minimizing, uh, a minimizing sequence uh, for this volume. I mean, uh, sets separating this volume in such a way that the perimeter goes to the infinite. Then we can apply some well-known result in geometric measure theory saying that uh, such a minimizing sequence splits as the union of two, of two sequences. One of them converges to a minimizer and the other one diverges in space. Uh, the important thing is that between these two uh, uh, sequences, we are covering all the volume. But now, since the global volume is finite, the divergent sequence has no volume at infinity. So there is no loss of volume at infinity. And this means that uh, the converging part recovers off, uh, all the volume in the limit. So the minimizer we attain, we, we achieve in the, in, the com in, the, in the limit of the converging part is a minimizer for the original volume, so that we have existence. Uh, what about regularity? Well, uh, in the case of weighted manifolds, uh, where the weight is as smooth and positive, including the boundary, then the regularity is exactly the same as in the case of Riemannian manifolds without weights. So, uh, the interior boundary of any minimizer decomposes as the union of two parts. Uh, the first part is a, a smooth embedded hypersurface, uh, maybe with boundary, in which case the boundary is exactly the intersection of the hypersurface with the boundary of the ambient space. And uh, the, second, the second part is a closed uh, singular set uh, whose Hausdorff dimension is uh, less than or equal to, to m minus 7. In particular, uh, if we are given a, a weighted manifold of low dimension, then mm, this set uh, does not exist and uh, the interior boundary, the whole interior boundary is smooth. Okay, uh, another property, uh, another desirable property for minimizers is uh, compactness. Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not ensured. Think, for example, in Gauss space, where isoperimetric regions are, are have spaces. In this case, uh, the isoperimetric region is not compact and the interior boundary is not compact. Uh, so, compactness is, is not ensured. However, uh, what is true, 
And what is always true is a, a more general property than, than compactness. This property uh, says that if we have an isoperimetric region, then uh, the, smooth, the smooth part of the boundary, of the interior boundary, is a hypersurface of null, of null capacity. Well, null capacity, uh, the capacity is a, is a well-known object uh, related to parabolicity, uh, Brownian motion. I'm not going to get into details here. Simply, I will simply say that the important thing or the um, analytic characterization of the fact that the capacity is zero is that we can find a sequence of, smooth, of smooth functions with compact support uh, which approximates the constant one function on the hypersurface in this way. Um, why, this, uh, why this is useful? Well, the, this is useful because uh, it allows extensions of divergent theorems and integration by part formulas for non-compact hypersurface uh, when we take uh, vector fields or functions uh, maybe having not, not uh, compact support but satisfying certain integrability conditions. And this will be very important, for example, uh, in order to attain uh, stability inequalities for isoperimetric regions for functions which maybe do not, do not vanish uh, along the boundary, along the, along the hypersurface in the boundary. Okay, uh, now uh, I, I will explain in more detail the, the stable result where we classify uh, stable sets in our setting. But before, let me say in some, some words about stable regions in general weighted manifolds. Well, uh, these, uh, these regions are uh, second order minima of uh, the perimeter under the volume constraint. And so uh, it is natural to to make a variational approach to study in detail which kind of analytical conditions you can deduce from the stability property. Well, uh, the first thing that we can do is uh, apply the, the first variational formulas, the Euler-Lagrange equation, if, if you want. When you, uh, when you compute these formulas, uh, then you deduce from stability, in fact, you deduce from, from, from the fact that uh, they set it at first order uh, minimum of the perimeter under a volume constraint, thus this quantity defined on the hypersurface must be constant. Note that this quantity involves the Riemannian mean curvature of the hypersurface and the uh, normal derivative of the logarithmic of the density. Well, the, this quantity is not uh, new, it's uh, the weighted uh, mean curvature of the F mean curvature which was uh, defined by Gromov, who was in fact uh, uh, the first one in computing the, the first variation of the of the weighted area functional. And the second conclusion is uh, typical, is standard, is the classical orthogonality condition uh, between the, the hypersurface and, uh, and, and the ambient manifold. <coughs> okay, uh, now uh, what happens about uh, second variation? Well, uh, if you compute uh, the second variation formulas for, for weighted uh, volume and area, then uh, you can deduce that uh, you can deduce this stability inequality. This stability inequality must hold for any function, a smooth function with compact support in your hypersurface and having mean zero with respect to the uh, weighted element of area. Well, in this uh, in this stability inequality, the left uh, hand side term is a quadratic form called the weighted index form, which involves uh, the, the gradient, the gradient of the function u, uh, the, back the normal bacriemery ricci curvature, the second fundamental form, the Riemannian second fundamental form of the hypersurface, and the second fundamental form of the cylinder. Of course, uh, when you consider the, when the weight, where the density is the constant one function, then we just uh, recover the, the classical, the Riemannian index form. Well, uh, this is general. So now observe that as happening in Riemannian manifolds, uh, when, the when the normal bacriemery ricci curvature is uh, non-negative and the boundary of the ambient domain is locally convex, then uh, the index four contains two non-positive terms. And so the stability condition is more restrictive. So uh, it is natural to assume both non-negativity of the bacriemery ricci curvature and uh, convexity in order to produce sharp 
classification results for a stable hypersurface or a stable regions. Uh, second, observe that the stability inequality uh, is uh, valid for uh, smooth functions with compact support. From a geometric uh, point of view, this means that uh, these functions uh, come from the formations, uh, from the formations when, when only a compact portion of the hypersurface is altered. You, you are only changing a compact portion of the hypersurface. And this is restrictive. This is restrictive because, as we have seen before, uh, this hypersurface sigma maybe is not compact. But you are only moving compact portions. So it, it, would, it would be desirable to extend this uh, stability inequality uh, to a more general situation coming from more general variations where maybe you are moving the whole hypersurface. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, it can be proved that uh, under the conditions I mentioned before, that is non-negativity of the Bacriomeri Ricci curvature and convexity of the boundary, then the stability inequality uh, comes more general and in fact uh, holds for uh, arbitrary bandwidth functions with uh, weighted uh, mean zero in this uh, weighted Sobolev space where we are considering uh, functions in L2 with distributional gradient in L2. Of course, I mean, uh, when, I mean uh, when I say L2, I mean with respect to the weighted area in this case. Well, and now is, uh, this is the place where we can see uh, the importance of the null capacity property. Because uh, in order to prove this theorem, we only have to, to start here from the classical uh, stability inequality. And using the classical stability inequality and the, the approximating sequence that a hypersurface with null capacity has, then uh, you, can, uh, you can extend the stability inequality in this way just in a minute. It's quite straightforward. Okay, and now the stability result. The stability result is the, is the following one. Uh, let me recall our setting. Uh, we have a, a cylinder. Uh, the base is an arbitrary Riemannian manifold with locally convex boundary. Inside this cylinder, we have a, a product density. There is a horizontal factor and a vertical one. Uh, the density satisfies a positive uh, lower bound on the Ricci curvature, which is achieved in the vertical killing field. So there is, well, well, in these conditions, the result says that if we are given a stable region, then the smooth, inter the, smooth uh, the, the interior boundary, the interior boundary of the set is a connective, uh, totally geodesic hypersurface meeting the boundary orthogonally. And moreover, we have these, uh, these properties that also appear in the isoperimetric result. This must be constant. Uh, this curvature achieves the positive uh, lower bound. And the second fundamental form must vanish in the, in the normal direction. OK, uh, let me give you a, a skin of the proof. OK, there are some things in the statement which come just for the first variation formulas. This one and the orthogonality condition. We have seen uh, these things before, so no comments. This can all just for the first variation formulas. Why sigma is connected? Oh, this is a very typical argument uh, uh, which, he, which holds since uh, we are assuming a positive uh, lower bound on the Ricci curvature. Otherwise, if we, is, if we would have more than one component, then we only have to span one of the components while shrinking the other one in order to preserve cost and the volume enclosed. And it is easy to see that uh, the, the perimeter is decreasing along this kind of variation because of this property. In the index for you only have to insert locally cost and nowhere vanishing functions and, and you deduce the connectivity in a minute by contradiction. Now the, the main part of the, the, the main part of the of the proof is the following. Mm, if you have an stability condition uh, and you want to characterize uh, stable sets, then you have to use a, a sharp deformation, a suitable deform volume preserving deformation of the set. Well, the deformation is the is the following. Suppose first that uh, our hypersurface 
is not vertical. Here by vertical, I mean that the, the vertical killing field is always tangent to the hypersurface. Suppose this is not true. Okay, so imagine that you have, for example, I, I will give a two-dimensional picture. This is your, your cylinder. And imagine that this is sigma. So the variation is the following. First, you consider the, the formation of the set by, by normal geodesics, by, by parallel hypersurfaces. Imagine that this is the set, E, and now you have another set, which is the one bounded by the parallel at, at a small distance t. Of course, this is, a, this is not a volume-preserving variation. What we do now? What we do now is, uh, it, it is more or less natural. You translate along the direction of the, key, of the killing field. Well, I'm saying that this is, uh, is a killing field, and, as, and of course, it, it, it will preserve the Riemannian area, but not the weighted area. This is the key idea. When you do this in a Riemannian cylinder, then you are not going to obtain a volume-preserving variation since vertical translations are isometries. Uh, in our case, vertical translations are still isometries for the Riemannian, for the Riemannian manifold, but uh, they are changing the, the weighted area, the weighted area. So now you simply translate, you perform a suitable, a suitable translation in such a way that the, the volume separated by the hypersurface is preserved. Okay, so this is geometrically the idea. And what happens uh, with the deformation? What, what is the associated test function? The associated test function uh, is uh, this one here. It involves the angle function plus a constant, which is put in here just for having mean zero. Okay, so now we put this in the index four and we perform some computation. I, of course, I'm not going to give you the details, but there is an important thing in the, computation, in the computation, which is this one. The angle function is an eigenfunction, oh, sorry, the, is an eigenfunction associated to the uh, weighted Jacobi operator. The weighted Jacobi operator, as happens in Riemannian manifolds, is uh, the Laplacian plus a potential. The potential is the natural generalization here, the weighted Ricci curvature, the second fundamental core, and this weighted Laplacian involves not only the, La, not only the Riemannian Laplacian, but also a, a term plus a term which involves the, the gradient of the logarithm of the density. Okay, so uh, after some computations, the stability condition applied to this uh, test function gives the claim. In the case when the, when the hypersurface is non-vertical. Is non what happens in the, in the vertical case? In the vertical case, if, if you mm, follow this uh, procedure, then you get nothing. You, you don't get a, a volume preserving variation because when you translate, you obtain the, the, the same thing. Um, when you do parallels, you, you obtain something. But then when you translate, you obtain nothing. You, uh, you are preserving the hypersurface after parallels and you are not preserving the volume. But in this case, uh, what we do is, uh, as this is a very particular case, uh, the stability condition is not difficult to, to study explicitly. And uh, using the, the Poincaré inequality uh, in, in the real line with Gauss space, uh, you can deduce the same conclusions. The hypersurface must be totally, must be, is totally geodesic. So this is more or less the, the idea of the proof of the stability result. Uh, it's over, no? Okay. So, uh, well, uh, I stop here. Uh, only one detail remains, the final comparison, which is done by uh, some kind of uh, integration of differential inequalities. This is more or less uh, standard. So I think that the, the, novel, the novel part of the proof is the stability result. 
Uh, well, here I only have some comments uh, about uh, the progress of F-stable minimal surfaces and CMC surfaces in the last years. This is a, an active uh, topic of research recently. Uh, and well, I stop here and thank you very much. <laughs>